Hello everybody, I consider myself a very lucky person. As petrol heads go, I live a blessed life. Today I am celebrating the fact that a quarter of a million of you have signed up to follow me and my sometimes ill-advised adventures. During this time I have been given the chance to drive an incredible selection of amazing machinery. I've driven a Ford Model T, I've driven a 100 year old Bentley, I've driven the latest Ferrari, I've experienced petrol, diesel, electric, cars with everything from one cylinder to 12. Sports cars, saloon cars, 4x4s, hatchbacks, minivans, everything. Sure, there's still a whole world of cars out there I've yet to get my claws into, but by any normal metric, I've had several lifetimes worth of motoring enjoyment. And with that as my CV, today I'm paying tribute to what I think is the greatest category of all, cheap cars, personified today by a 2004 Skoda Octavia diesel. This video is going to be about 50-50 car review and also philosophy. I'd also love to invite you all to hop into the comment section down below and share your memories, fond or otherwise, of the cheap cars you've had in your life. Enjoy. <laughs> In case today's video inspires you to head to the darkest recesses of the classifieds, no, not the giddy heights of eBay Motors, I'm talking the dusty corners of Gumtree and Facebook Marketplace, you need to know about Car Vertical. Because no matter how little you are paying for a car, it will only be worth the money asked if it is what the seller claims it to be. Car Vertical will help you make sure that is the case. Available on both desktop and as a mobile app, simply pop a VIN number or registration plate into Car Vertical and 60 seconds later you'll be be given an in-depth and easy to read report telling you all the things you want to know about any potential purchase. For a special discount on the service, please use my link in the comment section or the description down below. So what is it that we're driving today? This is a 2004 Skoda Octavia TDI Elegance, meaning it has some fancy stuff like a little bit of leather in here. More than that though, I think this is actually a particularly fascinating specimen because not only does it extol the virtues of bargain motoring today, it also tells us an awful lot about how the landscape has changed in the last two decades. I think this car is an excellent representation of what your average buyer would have been on the hunt for in the early to mid 2000s. Firstly, it is a saloon car. Okay, technically a hatchback, what Toyota would call a liftback, but let's just call it a saloon, shall we? Sure, we had hatchbacks and SUVs back then. They've both been popular for a little while, but weren't bought in quite the same numbers as they are today, particularly the case for the SUV. It's also a diesel. Power comes here from a 140 PS version of the fabled PD lump. Here, the two litre rather than the much loved 1.9, but still an excellent unit. Though today, the black fuel is about as popular as a fart in an elevator, way back when it was quickly becoming the de facto choice for just about anybody. Spend a few minutes behind the wheel of this and you'll work out why. It has oodles of torque, particularly when compared with the naturally aspirated petrols, which really would have been the alternative at the time. Torque here as standard was about 236 pound foot, or 320 newton meters. Of greater interest to the average Joe, though, was the fuel economy. Even without trying, in this car, it's very possible to achieve close to 50 to the gallon. And, with a little bit of effort, even better than that. That's incredible. Fleet managers and company car drivers, which we still had a lot of back then, also fell in love with them because low CO2 meant low benefit in kind, which meant that the cars were cheaper. The fact they'd also do galactic mileage and were generally quite reliable also kept your buyer happy. But now, if you think about it, just about the only part of this car I'd say is more socially acceptable today than it was then is the badge. In the UK at least, I'm sure that's partly down to a genius marketing campaign that was run around the time this was in production. The rest of it is just about as undesirable as it gets. Nobody really wants to buy a saloon. They either want a small car, which is a hatchback, or a really big one, an SUV. Diesel has seen a reversal in popularity only exceeded by that of 1970s BBC TV presenters. And even the transmission is now thoroughly old hat. A six-speed manual, which at the time would have been quite a selling point, but today nobody wants because all they're really after is a nice, easy-to-drive automatic. In a car like this, I can kind of get that, but there is something rather lovely about being able to row your own gears.
Chris has had this car for two years now. And how much did he pay for it? Nothing. That's right, he was given this car. And don't think like that was an act of charity. The fact was, it belonged to a client of his who'd been trying to move it on, but nobody wanted to buy it. So Chris said, look, if you're in a bit of a bind, I'll have it off you in exchange for a little bit of work. He took it and has enjoyed it ever since. In reality, I'd say something like this today is probably worth between 700 to 1,000 pounds. That seems to be the going rate now for anything with an MOT that isn't dodgy. Before you think Chris did some poor chap over, I hasten to add that there were a few quirks that the car came with. First off, the usual dents, scrapes and scratches that you'd expect with a car of this vintage and mileage. Mechanically, the car was generally pretty sound, but the biggest issues were of an electrical nature. The stereo, parking sensors were both non-functional, the headlights were stuck permanently on. More worryingly, when you turned the car off, the engine didn't stop for about five minutes. The rear wiper also doesn't work. That perhaps is for the best because it turns out it's collapsed. If you put it into reverse, the HVAC goes absolutely mad and turns everything up full blast. And when you do turn the car off, it forgets everything. Radio stations, trip computer, the lot. It cannot remember who, what, where or why it was. Chris is no stranger to Banganomics and the first rule of that is that any expenditure must be absolutely necessary. You have to be brutal with every single penny that you spend. As a financial advisor, Chris is perfectly trained for this. He took it to his local auto electricians who said that at some point in the past somebody had put in a new wiring loom. Not very well. This was the reason for not necessarily all, but certainly many of the issues. And they said to fix it would take at least a day's labour. At £75 an hour, that would quickly put the future of anything like this into doubt. So, quick thinking Chris said, tell you what, I've got £250, can you do £250 worth of fixes and then stop? So the car does still forget who, what, where, when or why it is every time you turn it off, but mercifully when you do take the key out the engine will cease turning, the headlights will also turn off when you tell them and the stereo works, basic though it may be. I suppose that's another sign of just how old this car is, it has a CD player. I remember when I went to America back in 2015 and I drove a then brand new Corvette, I'd burned a whole disc of tracks to listen to while I was out there, only to find the car didn't have anywhere for me to put my CDs other than the glove box. That was a heartbreaking moment, I can tell you. And I'm sure many of an older generation are still bitter about the fact they've got nowhere to put their cassette copy of Deep Purple's Machine Head. In any case, since its bout of electrolytis was more or less fixed, the car has been relatively faultless and asked nothing from Chris barring regular service and maintenance. How much is that? Well, in the spirit of Bangonomics, when it comes service time, Chris buys all the components he requires off Amazon, takes it to a local backstreet garage who charge £25 an hour for labour, but on account of the fact it only takes about 45 minutes to service this, they charge him 15 quid. At one point it was recommended he replace the cam belt and water pump. Doing that all in labour and parts was 400 quid. And I have to be honest, my only real surprise is that Chris doesn't drive this car more, because simply put, it's brilliant. One thing he did do to it recently was give it a bit of a remap, so it no longer puts out 140 horsepower, it's instead closer to 180. And this thing is really rather brisk. Allow me to demonstrate. So it start at 35, and I put my foot down now, 2100 RPM, third gear. Foot down, 40, 50, and it's 60. Even had a little bit of traction control like flash up there as we went over a manhole cover. This thing is brisk. Response from the engine is fabulous, really good. The gearbox is far better than it has any right to be. And this is comfortable, really, really comfortable. I'm currently debating whether to buy a first generation Porsche Cayenne, a two and a half ton SUV from a luxury manufacturer with air suspension. This, I think, might ride a little bit better. Sure, it's not as overall luxurious and all that jazz, but the fact is, this is a really nice, comfy car. Because that's how cars were. And sure, many of them still are, but I wound up spending too much time driving the pointy end of stuff, the top of the line stuff. And with those, there's this constant temptation to fit sports suspension, which really is a code for firm, uncomfortable, and generally miserable. This, for a daily proposition, is so much better.
this car is also pretty much perfectly sized. You'll get four adults in here, maybe not four six foot sixes, but four regular people, no problem whatsoever. The boot is also a brilliant size, easily big enough for two suitcases, making this a perfect airport car. It's even quite a lot of fun to hustle. Sure, the steering is far from brilliant, but it's also a lot better than in many other modern VW products that I care to name. I know, yes, this is a Skoda, but let's face it, underneath, this is a VW. And that really isn't a particularly bad thing. In fact, one of the reasons that the Skoda brand has grown in popularity of late is because people have realised you can get all the stuff that you like about VW, if you like it, I appreciate that not everyone does, in a package that still looks pretty decent, but is just a lot more keenly priced. I'm quite taken with the Skoda brand, you know. So, price aside, this is a good car. Full stop. No caveats, no ifs, no buts, no wells. It is a decent automobile. It has plenty of space, plenty of power, plenty of practicality. It's nice to drive, is more than capable of doing just about anything that most people would require of a car. And you can pick one of these up for next to nothing. Unfortunately, car prices across the board are higher than they used to be, but this is about as close to a dirt cheap car as I think you're likely to find in the modern market. As I said at the beginning, this to me perfectly exemplifies the joys of bargain motoring from so many different perspectives. I am lucky enough, like I said, to have driven a great variety of cars, and I'm really, really lucky that I'm now able to own a few very nice things too. I know the internet fairly well, and I'm sure there's a few people out there saying, cool, well, James, if you like cheap cars so much, why do you bother with the Ferraris and stuff? Well, that's because I want them. I like them. They're aspirational. I don't think there's anything wrong with people wanting something a little bit nicer than what they have. That's just human nature. It's good to have things that you want. It motivates you to work. It's motivated me. But it also means I've now gained a sense of perspective, because I know what it's like when you don't have that much money, your budget is limited, and you can afford what you can afford afford. You always think the grass is greener on the other side, and sure, there are certain things about more expensive cars that will be better. You'll have more leather, maybe a little bit faster, all that jazz. But the fact is, I promise you, I promise you now, and if you've gone through a similar automotive journey to myself, or you've gone through the ranks of things, please hop into the comment section down below and confirm my suspicions that as you spend a little bit more money on a car, you become increasingly nostalgic for the stuff that you had before. You suddenly realise that, no, the grass wasn't greener on the other side. You drive down a road like this in a Ferrari and you're going, oh my, oh my, oh my. Oh my, please no one come the other way. Please no one come the other way. I'm so worried. I'm so worried. I'm going to go scratch the car. I'm going to get a dent it. Crunch. What was that? Oh my God. How much is that going to be? You're just panicked all the time. This is not to say they can't be enjoyable cars and they can't raise a smile because trust me, they can. But for something to just hop in, go do some miles, this is such a good car. You can take this anywhere, anytime, for pretty much any reason, and you just don't care. And here we go, on time to prove my point, a horse box. Either gonna say thank you, no. No, you're not, you miserable, miserable people. Cold, dead eyes, cold, dead eyes. Mm. Not me though, because I'm driving a bargain bin Skoda Octavia. And I know, were something terrible to happen to this car, Chris would say, oh well, we'll have to get another one. I would obviously be mortified, and I'm not the sort of person that's gonna deliberately break a car to prove a point. What am I, Top Gear? But I'm sure many of you know what it is that I'm talking about. The similar sort of feeling you get when you're asked to look after someone's pet or their child. It has such great value to them and is so irreplaceable that you, you do worry. There's a sense of relief when the moment is over. Sure, you might have had a little bit of fun or whatever, but to hand the keys back to a fancy car is always a very, very pleasant feeling. I also feel like this is the kind of car completely overlooked by the next generation of people coming into the motoring world. That I think is down to a lot of different things, in Britain in particular, and it is a very British thing, we're obsessed with having the latest and the greatest. Nobody, nobody that's 20 years old will want to be seen dead with an iPhone 6. That's, that's so, so old hat, ugh, granddad, what are you doing? But with stuff like this, I think there's a real charm, there's a real appeal to it. And very often you'll find that sometimes the old ways weren't the best, but they did have certain things about them that were just a little bit better. This car is very frugal, very easy to drive, very nice. And yeah, sure, we know now, 
the diesels were a little bit evil. But to me, the one thing worse than continuing to use and enjoy this car until such a point as it becomes economically unviable would be to bin it ahead of its time. That to me would be the ultimate waste. And I, I just can't stand the idea of that. That sounds awful to me. Power! It really is quite big, this thing. Now, I do understand there may be a lot of people for whom something like this just wouldn't work out. I know a lot of people in the comment section like to say, well, I don't know why anybody bothers to finance a car. Finance is terrible and evil and all this, that and the other. Yes, I work with a finance company, but they would be the first people to say, don't finance something if you don't have to, don't want to, and aren't completely and totally sure that you can afford it. However, when it comes to really cheap cars, sometimes financing could be the most sensible option. I'm not trying to sell you finance here, by the way. What I'm saying is that there are some people out there for whom buying a five, six hundred quid car may be a little bit beyond their budget. But more than that, when it breaks, maybe they can't afford the two or three hundred quid that might be nothing to you, but a lot to them to get it back on the road. For those who can afford to be a little bit flexible with when the car is or isn't on the road or are willing to be a little bit more hands-on or do know a friendly local garage that charges you a pittance, something like this is really, really worthwhile. This is a car I would happily drive all the way up to Scotland, drive around the NC500 because you know it's probably going to get you there. In fact, no, it's almost certainly going to get you there. It's going to get you back. You're not going to have spent an awful lot of money. And the fact is, if being able to have something like this is the difference between somebody having a car and not having a car, we should all all of us petrol heady types be celebrating it sure it may be the least cool the least desirable the least sexy thing many can possibly imagine but it's a car it's mobility it's freedom i know a lot of us think that the idea of a petrol head is doomed that nobody from the next generation is interested whatsoever in cars nothing could be further from the truth those people are out there but it is something that's becoming increasingly exclusive expensive and difficult to get into I think in many cases there are a lot of people that don't want to buy into cars because they're afraid of being judged by others or what it says about them. No, allow me to tell you, if you're a young chap, chapette or anything in between and you're thinking about getting a car but all you can afford is something like this, there is no shame in it. None. None whatsoever. Everyone in the comment section now, please help me out here. Help me out. Encourage someone. Save a petrol head. Hop into the comment section and tell me that it doesn't matter what you buy. Start somewhere. Start somewhere. And I'll guarantee you there's a whole bunch of Ferrari owners out there who would give anything to have their first car back. Because at the end of the day, the machine is a vessel. It is gears, oil, wires, in this case, not very good ones, all connected together to create, in some cases, something a little bit more. Sometimes something a little bit less, but on occasion, something a bit more. Memories. If you are that person at the beginning of your motoring journey and you're wondering what is the right first step to take, the answer is dead simple. It's any step. Just do it. Stop thinking about it. Stop worrying. Just do it. Get into a car, any car, and actually, if it's one like this, I'll tell you what, you've lucked out because this is really <laughs> annoyingly good. Whoa, easy tiger. Ah, that's a little rant from me. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if I've inspired one person to go out and buy a right old heap, even if they're a multimillionaire and need something to take down the station, I'll class that as a victory. And once again, I want to say a huge thank you to the quarter million of all of you that have subscribed. And to the rest of you, could you please hit that uh, subscribe button because I need another 750,000 of you before Google send me anything more in the post. Anyway, that's about enough from me. Don't forget to hit the like button and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.